Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14664 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the timetable for the Prescription Scotland Bill at Stage 3. Can I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion? They should press the request to speak buttons now. No one has requested, so I ask Graeme Day to move the motion, please. Presiding officer. Thank you. No member has asked to speak. Therefore, the question is that motion 14664 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Next item of business is stage three proceedings on the Prescription Scotland Bill in dealing with the amendments members should have. The bill is amended at stage two. That is SP Bill 26A, the marshalled list and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as, after, as, as soon after as possible I call the group. Can I ask members now to refer to the marshal list of amendments? I call Amendment 1, the name of Neil Finlay, group with Amendments 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Neil Finlay, please, to move Amendment 1 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Thank you. Thanks, President Officer. I move the amendment in my name and speak to all amendments in the group. There are a number of common sense reforms in this bill and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee accepted uh, these unanimously. But there are other areas I believe uh, further change is needed. Chief amongst these is the amount of time authorities can chase council tax arrears and reserve social security benefits uh, and tax credits, including the recovery of overpayments. Uh, currently, that period in Scotland is as long as 20 years. Uh, if you think of things that have gone on in your life in 20 years, uh, think of what it would be like if you had a debt, possibly one that you were not aware of, uh, and at any time, with little warning, see that debt called in by a creditor. You may have no records or co recollection of that debt, and it might be for a debt you may not know you even ever had. That cannot be right. But that is what's being proposed for debts that are owed for council tax and reserve benefits to the DWP. Why the Scottish Government appears to be taking their line from the DWP in this matter, I do not understand. Uh, indeed, why is the Government proactively seeking the endorsement mm -hmm. of the DWP as the Minister did in her letter to them? when in England the prescription period for the same benefits is six years. The intention of these amendments is not to reduce the amount of money that councils have access to. Scottish Labour has been fighting relentlessly over the years for sustainable, sustainable and meaningful solutions to the chronic underfunding of Scotland's local authorities. This is about the collection of debt payments within a reasonable timescale. And let's be clear, the proposed exemptions do not mean that the pursuer has 20 years for the recovery of the entire debt or 20 years from when the debt was incurred, it's 20 years from your last payment or even the acknowledgement. This situation will leave people in Scotland open to penalties, potentially for decades, uh, after the event in question has occurred, even if they are not aware it actually happened. And we know that many debtors in Scotland have already been pursued for council tax arrears or benefit over payments more than five years after they allegedly happened. The CAB have shown us numerous case studies where clients are being pursued for debts that they have never been notified about and the historic records from councils and the DWP produce very little to back them up. This causes stress, anxiety and family pressure. On Tuesday, we had ministers and many of the rest of us rightly lay in to the DWP on their shambolic handling of universal credit. But at the same time, we have the minister writing to Esther McVeigh of all people and seeking her advice on how they can agree the line and give answers to Parliament about a more punitive debt recovery system in Scotland. Why is the government uh, asking for five years for Scottish Social Security, uh, for the Scottish Social Security Agency payments, but 20 years to continue for reserved benefits? These amendments bring us more in line with England and Wales. They're supported by Citizens Advice, uh, Citizens Advice Scotland, the Govan Law Centre, Step Change and Money Advice Scotland and welfare rights organisations and the Scottish Law Society. Finally, President Officer, with Amendments 5, 6 and 7, we're offering a compromise. 
where we can delay the introduction of the five-year prescription by five years to allow local authorities to collect uh, the affected debts. I hope the change at Chamber will support these amendments and ensure that we have a fair, humane and timorous debt recovery system. Uh, have you concluded or is it an intervention? I've concluded. It is concluded. Please sit down. I have two members wishing to speak. Graeme Simpson, who will be followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you. I'll uh, try, try to keep it brief. Um, all the amendments in this group and the second group uh, relate to Section 3 of the Bill. Section 3 says that all statutory obligations to pay money should fall within five-year prescription. It lists some exceptions, which Section 3 says should remain subject to 20-year prescription only. The Stage 3 amendments all relate to the exceptions in, that, in Section 3. Um, the policy debate is whether these types of debts, council tax and, and reserve social security benefits, should be subject to five or 20 year prescription. Now this set of amendments, all from Neil Finlay, who I have to thank personally for his time on the DPLR committee, deal with exceptions for council tax. The question is, do we allow councils 20 years to recover debts or limit it to just five. And here I think the submission from COSLA is compelling. The committee wrote to all councils asking for their views. COSLA have said that any attempt to impose a five-year prescription period um, would have significant consequences financially and in terms of the social contract between citizens and their local authority area. I, I wish to carry on. Moving to a five-year prescription period for local tax would undermine these aims. Councils would be forced to secure court decrees through affirmative court proceedings, which would increase costs for councils, citizens and Scottish court service. And condensing the prescription period would potentially mean local authorities will not have the space to be flexible and come to individual payment plans with a debtor, instead having to acknowledge the debt through early court action resulting in decree. Now, more than £2 billion worth of council tax debt is currently owed across Scotland. 1.2 billion of that relates to debts that are more than five years old. That's money that could be spent on local services. Making the prescription period for those debts five years would likely force a change in the way that councils recover that debt. And for those reasons, we don't support Neil Finlay's amendments. Tom Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I intend to be very uh, brief. I am a member of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Now, I would just like to put on record my thanks to my fellow committee members and the clerks and legal advisors and researchers who have certainly, for me, shed light on what is quite a, a complicated piece of uh, law. As I said at stage two, where nearly all of these amendments were discussed and rejected, I have a great deal of sympathy for the aims and motivations behind this. But the concerns that I have at stage two remain, which is fundamentally that of unintended consequences. With regards to council tax, COSLA have been very clear in their position. It was interesting, if I recall an evidence we had from Mike Daly, he floated the idea of potentially a compromise where there would normally be a five-year prescription, but in exceptional circumstances where fraud were perhaps suspected, there could be 20-year prescription. Now, I think these are the kind of ideas that merit further investigation. And unfortunately, we've just not had the opportunity in this piece of legislation, which is actually very narrowly defined and technical, to fully explore all of these areas. So while I'm certainly sympathetic, to, to, to the uh, intentions and motivations behind these amendments. Unfortunately, there simply hasn't been enough work done on them to make sure that we are in a position where we can be absolutely sure that there's no unintended consequences. And with regards to um, the uh, position with relating to um, reserved benefits, Again, I am sympathetic to that, but clearly there's unintended consequences that we have not been able to properly fully explore. And I would just gently say to the Labour Party, actually, the best solution is for benefits to be completely devolved to this Parliament, something Labour resisted absolutely during the Smith Commission process. Minister. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me begin by saying that this bill is about the practical difficulties the negative prescription has had in practice. It is not an appropriate place to make substantial policy changes in specific areas, and it is not a shortcut for Neil Finlay to make far-reaching and unrecognised changes to the recover, recovery of council tax. The bill's aim is not to change the position of council tax, as Mr Finlay has alluded to, but to maintain the status quo as it is currently understood. 
Local taxes form a substantial source of income for local authorities, paying for essential services like education, housing, roads, etc. COSLA have told the committee that a 20-year prescription period for recovery of arrears allows local authorities to quickly begin the recovery process at minimal cost to taxpayers, all the while protecting those who owe arrears by entering into long-term arrangements. And all of this would be jeopardised by changing and shortening the prescription period. I'll give way. For giving way Andy just... Whiteman. I thank you, President Gross. I thank the Minister for giving way. Does she accept that the current regime for recovering council tax debt is pernicious? I think every member in this chamber probably has casework of people who have lost their job, who've been a student and not a student, who've moved out of shared accommodation, who've split up with their partner and find themselves in the tyranny of sheriff officers knocking at the door. Does she accept that there's a powerful case uh, that we made as early as May 20, uh, uh, June 2016 of fundamental reform in the way that council tax is administered to, 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 to prevent the dire circumstances in which many people have found themselves? Minister. I take the member's point on that, but this bill is not the place to address those issues. COSLA have said that it would be extremely rare for an action to be raised on an account which is more than five years old. However, it's common for debt to be repaid in small amounts over a period of more than five years, particularly as council tax debt is a recurring obligation. And just because local authorities have 20 years before the debt owed is extinguished by prescription, that doesn't mean that they can wait 10, 15 or even 19 years before attempting recovery. Scots law recognises the separate doctrine of delay. If local authorities were to wait unduly before seeking to recover their debt, that defence might be available to the debtor to bar the pursuer for enforcing their rights. The committee themselves wrote seeking further information and received an impressive number of responses. 26 out of the 32 local authorities and not one agreed that changing the prescription period was appropriate. Instead, they were all adamant that no change to the status quo should be made and this even includes 10 councils under Labour leadership. Mm. Among the points made by local authorities were that the policy reasons which justify accepting taxes payable to the Crown, so that's HMRC and Revenue Scotland from the five-year prescription, apply equally to taxes payable to local authorities. In other words, there should be no distinction made between taxes owed to central government and those owed to local authorities. I'll give way. Sorry, Neil Finlay. Because there is a distinction, because in, in, in relation to benefits, they, they, they want a 20, you want a 20-year period for uh, reserve benefits, but five years in Scotland. Why don't you bring them into line? Minister. In the case of the reserve benefits, that is because Scottish ministers have complete control over the policy, they have control over the processes. Scottish ministers do not have control over the policies or the processes of councils or of the DWP. But I do think that the member really ought to explain to the chamber why he thinks that all the councils in Scotland are wrong on this issue and he is right. Does he take no and account Labour, of the Labour views councils. of councils on this issue? And Labour councils. And Labour councils. Is that your own colleagues are telling you that this is not appropriate. They also pointed out, presiding officer, that Would any you both change sit to down prescription... If the members not take, excuse me, Minister, if the member is not taking his intervention, do sit down. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. They also pointed out that any change to prescription by reducing it would likely... Mr Lindhurst, I, Mr Lindhurst, I don't know if you're trying to make an intervention, but, it, well, if the member's not taking it, you simply have to sit down. Sorry. Thank you. Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Any change to prescription by reducing it would likely force a change in the way councils recover this debt, making it potentially more expensive to recover the monies owed. And this is all to the detriment of those who use and rely on our local services. Not only this, however, but local authorities are also concerned that changing prescription by reducing it will create an incentive to those who wish to avoid paying their taxes in the first place. Local authorities continue to recover a significant amount of arrears each year. More than £2 billion worth of council tax debt is currently owed across Scotland, and more than £1 billion of this relates to debts that are more than five years old. And even though we are told that we are reaching the end of austerity, this money is vitally needed for local services and not just the debtor. At the beginning of the week, we've had Labour's community spokesperson, Alex Rowley, talking about an end to austerity for local government, 
and a renewal of powers for our councils. But at the end of the week, we have Neil Finlay not only making it more difficult for local government to collect vital sums of money that they're owed, but we also have him making it even easier for those who do not want to pay council tax to do so. Point of order, Minister, please sit down. Point of order, Mr Lindhurst. Um, the, the, the point of order, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I wish to refer to is the, the Minister has referred to the concept of delay in Scots law preventing the raising of that's not, I'm afraid that's actions. not a point of order. So I, I want to know what Not point of order, Mr Linters. Thank you. Minister. Presiding Officer, tell me how fair it is to the millions of hard-working Scots who struggle to pay their council tax every month. Mr Finlay, on Tuesday in this chamber talked about his time as a frontline housing officer. He said he saw daily the struggles and challenges faced by people just trying to get by. How does this amendment help them if all it achieves is to force local authorities to raise individual court actions as they have told us that they would to recover the debt? It is because these amendments would make it easier for those who won't pay and more difficult for those who need more time to pay that I urge Neil Finlay not to press his amendments. Thank you. And I call on Neil Finlay to wind up and Mr Finlay Presser withdraw your Presiding amendment. Officer, I'm sure the Minister welcomed her briefing from Esther McVeigh because it seemed to provide the entirety of her speech. The reality is that the five-year period can be rolled over if a payment is made or an acknowledgement is made. Therefore, there's no absolutely it is true and there is no uh, that, that is no barrier. So the Minister is frankly wrong on that. Um, the consultation uh, when you write out to councils, well it's hardly a surprise if you write out to council chief finance officers that they're going to come back and say we want to collect money. Of course they're going to collect, of course they are going to say that. And let me say this, let me say this, isn't it, isn't it welcome that on some issues at least the government listen to COSLA on something. I hope they'll listen to COSLA on the budget. I hope they'll listen to COSLA on council workers' pay. I hope they'll listen to COSLA on testing for primary kids. Or is it only selectively that they listen to COSLA? I think it is. And what happened with poll tax debt? What did the council chief finance officers say about poll tax debt? And yet we dealt with that because the, this parliament agreed to deal with it. So the minister, again, is wrong. This is about putting in, uh, in place a decent, fair regime for debt recovery in Scotland in line with England. And yet, what we're going to have now, what we're going to have now, and the government are pursuing, is a more punitive regime for Scotland. So much for standing up for Scotland. Mr Finlay, uh, could you just say you're pressing your... I'm sure you are, but could you just say you're pressing your amendment? I shall be pressing my amendment. <laughs> Thank you. The question is, Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. And as this is the first division of the stage, the Parliament will be suspended for five minutes.
Thank you. We'll now proceed with the division on Amendment 1. This is a 30-second division, and members should cast their votes now. Thank you. They voted yes, 27, no 78. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And now we move on to group two and I call amendment two in the name of Mark Griffin in a group on its own. Mr. Griffin, please to move and speak to amendment two. Thank you, President Officer. My amendment today is the same as the one I submitted at stage two and withdrew with the agreement of the committee. As I explained then, I'm seeking to reduce the prescription period for reserved and DWP debts to five years. This amendment removes the exception to the rule, to the five-year rule the government wishes to pursue. And to be clear, this was something which was missing earlier today, that would not consolidate the debt recovery process into five years, but would mean recovery must begin in those five yeah. years. Not only is my amendment consistent with the Law Commission's original principle that all debts should be covered by a five-year rule, but it would put the rules in line with those debts owed to Social Security Scotland, our new system built on dignity and respect. In their joint briefing, support my amendment, Citizens Advice Scotland, Money Advice Scotland and State Change explain that, if passed in its current form today, the prescription bill will afford the DWP a more privileged status to recover debts than Social Security Scotland. Given that DWP debts don't have an explicit place in the 1973 Act, the government's exception mean that Scots law would go further and explicitly extend the powers of the DWP. The DWP may implicitly rely on paragraph 2A of Schedule 1 in that Act, but to explicitly spell out new rights accepting it from the five-year rule would go further. I'm sure that isn't the intention of this chamber or our desired policy outcome, which is why I'm asking members to support my amendment today. Now, at stage two, I asked the Minister what is the Scottish Government's view on treating DWP debt the same way we will in Scotland. The Minister's response was that it was a matter for the DWP and that this bill is not the place to change it. And that's patently wrong. This is a prescription bill in the devolved Scottish Parliament. This is precisely where we change it. It's for this Parliament to decide on our own laws governing debt collection, not for the DWP to dictate a timescale and for the government to passively accept that demand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Minister told the committee repeatedly, wholeheartedly relying on the DWP's evidence, that it was the DWP's view that a five-year rule would cause hardship through overzealous and rapid recovery. And still, since then, the Minister has even written to Esther McVeigh, of all people of this Tory government, for answers to the points I made at that stage two meeting. That is unbelievable. The Minister is either looking for the DWP to tell her whether she should support the five-year rule, or she is looking for the DWP to tell MSPs that they are wrong. Yep. Minister. The reason that the Scottish Government was seeking clarity on some of these issues is because Mark Griffin himself had said that this, he thinks that this amendment would only affect a very small number of people. But in fact, the reality of it is that it's 413,000. What does the member have to say to that? Mark Griffin. <laughs> that was a good answer from Esther McVeigh that the Minister <laughs> read out. <laughs> It's clear the Scottish Government doesn't know why it opposes Labour's amendment. It's only doing what Esther McVeigh tells them. But the DWP's assertion they would need to collect all debts within the five years is wrong. It's built on a misconception of both the bill and how the five-year rule works. The DWP, even if this bill passes unmodified, has a plethora of tools to collect debts, and believe me, it does earnings and bank attachments and deductions from live benefits, 
Even seizures are used in some ways or another before it relies on a court process. And as Citizens Advice Scotland reiterate, if the debt is called or acknowledged or even a single payment is made using those recovery mechanisms, that five-year window restarts up to the hard 20-year limit this bill will introduce. And at stage two, I told the committee the DWP should get its house in order. If it's doing its job and paying people the right benefit, it can surely recover debts in a timorous fashion. Waiting years to chase up its debts or being given another 15 years to recover debts is wrong. Should it not have its house in order to collect those debts within five years? Now, we know that the DWP would prefer recovery through its reserve powers, not through a court decree or document of debt. However, if it did exercise its right under the proposed amendment, it would have five years to take action. Mm. That's far more reasonable than 20 years. And crucially, crucially, it's in line with the position of this parliament yes. in relation to our own Social Security Act. In May, the then Minister for Social Security said, if Parliament's view is that five years is generally a fair and equitable period to allow for the recovery of debts, the Scottish Government's view is that it fits best with the aim of treating people with dignity and respect by that general rule. Where there has been an overpayment, people should expect the agency to act promptly in deciding whether to recover it. But surely after Parliament agreed accordingly in April, the same principle applies to DWP debts. Presiding officer, this debate is in stark contrast to the one that we had on Tuesday. Just two days ago, the whole chamber, apart from the Tories, collectively condemned the UK government and the DWP in particular for their handling of universal credit and the misery and poverty that is causing. Today, we have the government doing the bidding of the DWP and Tory government. The DWP and Tory government of the rape clause, the two child limit, the benefits freeze, sanctions, the bedroom tax and everything else to pour far longer periods for recovery for reserved social security debts than our own social, Scottish Social Security Agency would have. I move Amendment 2 in my name. Thank you. Now, before I, I call Tom Martha, can I can remind members if they want to speak in relation to amendment, it's helpful if they press the request to speak buttons as soon as we move on to that amendment. I call Tom Arthur. Thank you, President <laughs> Officer. Very briefly, um, the arguments put forward by Mr Griffin are almost um, identical to the arguments he put forward at stage two. And as I said at that point, and as I said in responding to Neil Finlay earlier this afternoon, I am sympathetic to the motives and the intentions, but clearly, the cons but the clearly there is a concern for unintended consequences, given they are reserved benefits. So the question I posed to Mark Griffin at stage two was, what engagement, Mr Griffin, have you had with the DWP to clarify these points? His answer was none. So can I ask him, if ahead of stage three, what work has he done to clarify that? Because ultimately there's a danger of unintended consequences and it is a responsibility and duty as legislators to fully investigate these matters. That's all I have to say. Uh, have you concluded? I have concluded. I'm sorry, he's concluded, Mr. No, he's concluded. I call the Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to begin this section but again by reiterating the aim of this bill is not fundamental reform of the law of negative prescription, but rather to fix problems that have arisen in practice. The amendment from Mark Griffin, uh, the amendment that Mark Griffin has lodged, departs from the status quo. I listened to the speech Mark Griffin made in the chamber on Tuesday, in which he urged MSPs to act to help people who are suffering. But if we look at his amendment here today, what it does is change the length of time in which the DWP can recover overpayments of reserve benefits, reducing it from the current 20 years to five. Why does this matter? Because it would force the DWP to take debtors to court so that they can have the same amount of time that they already have under the current system. In terms of the potential impact, the value of debt owed to the DWP over five years old currently stands at just over £1.2 billion, and this belongs to 413,000 debtors. So for those who are able to pay off their debts, but only in periods of time of over the five years, say six, seven, eight or more years, Mark Griffin's amendment would have an enormous yep. impact on them, yep. um, making them face even more hardship. And that's a large amount of families to increase hardship on. This is especially so given that the rate of deductions taken from benefits is set out in legislation and other debts can take priority. 
and it was only on Tuesday that Mark Griffin talked about the growing number of arrears as a result of universal credit. It will mean that debtors now not only have to pay off their debt, but may also have the extra expense of legal proceedings over and above the original sum. They will also have to pay an annual judicial rate, and the interest on that is 8%. To put this into context, the current base rate of interest in the UK is 0.75%. And not only this, because the debtor will then have a mark on their credit score, that will affect their ability to gain, to gain credit in the future. Writing about wider income pressures, the head of advocacy at the Carnegie UK Trust, Douglas White, recently pointed out that for, the many, for many, credit is something to be relied on as part of normal life. And debtors, as a result of Mark Griffin's proposed changes, may then find it more difficult to pay for unexpected bills. Mark Griffin has suggested that it is unfair to have a debt hanging over someone's head for 18 years before the DWP take action. But does, does he not realise that Scots common law recognises the doctrine of delay? And this law sits alongside negative prescription but separate for, from it. And this bill doesn't affect it. And what that means is if a pursuer were to wait 18 years before raising an action, as he suggested, the debtor would be able to rely on this defence to bar a pursuer for enforcing their rights. What Mark Driscoll is doing... Excuse me a minute. Ms Lamont, when the member is not taking intervention, please resume your seat. Please resume your seat. She's not taking... She's, she's waved your... Are you taking this intervention? No. Please resume your seat. I've asked you to resume your seat politely. Thank you. Minister, continue. What Mark Griffin is doing is trying to alter the behaviour of the DWP by changing the period of prescription from 20 years to the shorter period of five years, but, and this is the important point, so you may want to listen to this, without fully understanding and taking cognizance of the unintended consequences. There has been no widespread public consultation on what this amendment would mean. And I, I'll take an intervention. Neil Finlay. All of the case put forward by the minister, does she think that the CAB Scotland would be putting forward that case if what she says is correct? Does she think that the Govan Law Centre would, the Scottish Law Society would, Step Change would? The minister is wrong and she knows it and she's trying to blank out all the advice that we've had from the money agencies. Minister, it's more difficult Shame. for debtors, more difficult. Scottish ministers are not in control of the policies and the processes of reserve benefits. I would assume that would be clear to the Labour Party. Am I a fan of universal credit? No, I am not. I'm on record as saying that. But is this bill the place to make changes and try to control that? No, it isn't. It is not. And I assure the Chamber that I have the debtor firmly in my mind as I think about this. And when I say that the unintended consequences of this are likely, very likely, to increase hardship, I please take consideration of that. Mr Finlay, Mr Finlay, Mr... Uh, <laughs> please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please, please sit down. This is a very passionate debate, which I understand, but I want courtesy. And we've, we've have interventions, an intervention system which is up to the member. I don't want shouting across the chamber. It doesn't do anybody any good service. Minister, please, and you'll have to conclude. Thank you, presiding officer. This amendment would mean that there would be unintended co consequences, which could be extremely far-reaching. After all, it only seems like common sense that being told that you have more time to recover a debt if you take a court action will result in more court actions. This bill is intended to bring clarity to the area of the law and accepting this amendment would, I believe, only create uncertainty and it's highly undesirable. And for these reasons, I urge Mark Griffin not to press his amendment. Thank you. And I now call on Mark Griffin, please, to wind up. Would you press or withdraw this amendment? Thank you, President Officer. I have to say to Tom Arthur that I did look at the DWP evidence. I looked at it carefully. Um, I also looked at the evidence carefully from Citizens Advice Scotland, Step Change Scotland, Money Advice Scotland, from the Government Law Centre, and members who gave evidence. And the key to all that is, after reading that evidence, I came to the informed position that I have now, that I will be pressing my amendment. And the difference between this side and the Government side 
is that I've come to my own conclusion and I'm not reading from a DWP script. Now, this amendment would mean that recovery action would have to be taken within five years for reserved DWP debts. If any um, action was taken to recover debt within that five years, that five year period would then extend to another five years from the point of collection. If a single payment would, was made, that clock then starts again, another five years for the time of collection. If an acknowledgement is made of the debt, that five year clock starts again, another five years to collection, up to a hard limit of a total of 20 years as set out in the bill. That seems a very sensible position to take. That's the position this parliament took in relation to social security Scotland debts. The, the reasoning behind that um, from the government at the time was that that was considered to give people dignity and respect and the ability to challenge decisions. We know from our um, extensive casework, there are many occasions where the DWP make overpayments to people through agency error. Where is the ability to summon to look back 20 years, 20 years, presiding officer, to be able to challenge a DWP decision on overpayment as to whether it was their fault or whether it was the, the agency's fault. Who keeps those records for 20 years? Presiding officer, I urge members to support the, this uh, amendment for the reasons set out, not just by me, but by the Govan Law Centre, Citizens Advice Scotland, Money Advice Scotland, Step Change, and the whole range of uh, public debt advocates, and to reject the DWP arguments that the Minister brings to the Chamber today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Given. Uh, technically, you must press a withdrawal. Press. You must see, press or withdraw, technically. Pre press. Thank you very much. The question is, amendment to be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. There, is not a, there is not an agreement, therefore there will be a division. This is a 60-second division. Forgot to tell you, cast your votes in that 60 seconds. It's kind of important. Thank you. The result of the division is yes, 29, no, 81. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And now call amendment three in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with amendment one. Mr Finlay, to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There'll be a division. This is another 60 second. Div 30 second. It's a 30 second, sorry. It's a 30 second division and members should cast their votes now. The result of that division is yes, 29, no, 81. There were no abstentions. That amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment four in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with amendment one. Mr Finlay, move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment four be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. This is 30 seconds. Members should cast their votes now.
The result of that division is yes, 29, no, 81. There were no abstentions. That amendment is not agreed. Call amendment 5 in the name of Neil Finlay. Already debated with amendment 1. Mr Finlay, move or not move? Not move. The question, uh, call amendment 6 in the name of Neil Finlay. Already debated with amendment 1. Mr Finlay, move or not move? Not move. Call amendment 7 in the name of Neil Finlay. Already debated with amendment 1. Mr Finlay, move or not move? Not move. That ends consideration of amendments. Thank you. Before we move on to the debate, as members will be aware, at this point of the proceedings, the presiding officer is now required to consider understanding orders, whether or not, in his view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer has decided that, in his view, no provision relates to protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage two. Next item of business is debate on motion 14665 in the name of Ash Denham on the Prescription Scotland Bill at stage 3. Before I invite Ash Denham to open the debate, I call on Hamza Youssef to signify Crown consent to the bill. I call on Hamza Youssef. Officer, for the purposes of Rule 9.11 of the Standing Orders, I wish to advise the Parliament uh, that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purpose of the Prescription Scotland Bill, has consented to place her prerogative and interests so far as they, uh, they are affected by the Bill at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. Thank you. We now begin the debate. And I call on Ash Denham, Minister, to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be here today to open the debate on the Prescription Scotland Bill, and I would like to thank members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their work in considering this bill and also the work of the clerks supporting them. I'd also like to thank David Johnson QC and Gillian Swanson, whose work at the Scottish Law Commission informed this bill. The aim of the bill is to increase clarity, legal certainty and fairness in the law of negative prescription. In civil law, the doctrine of negative prescription serves a vital function. It sets time limits for when obligations and rights are extinguished. This serves the interests of individuals where, after a certain lapse of time, it is fairer to deprive one of a right rather than allow it to trouble the other. And it serves the public interest because litigation begun promptly encourages legal certainty. The law of negative prescription cuts across many policy areas, and we saw this today when we discussed Mark Griffin's amendment. Negative prescription is just one piece of a jigsaw, but an important piece. It's worth bearing in mind that the intentions of this bill are to resolve certain issues within the law of negative prescription that have caused difficulty in practice not to make changes in specific policy areas. So what does the bill do? Well, we've already heard about what Section 3 doesn't do, so I'd like to begin by explaining to everyone what it does do. It extends the five-year negative prescription to cover all statutory obligations to make payment that are not already subject to that rule. This new general rule significantly simplifies the law in this area because there are currently some such obligations that are not subject to five-year prescription, and it means that the list of specific obligations does not have to be continually updated. As we know, there are ex exceptions to this new rule, though, such as taxes, council tax, and DWP overpayments, which maintain the current position. Negative prescription is about the extinction of obligations after they become enforceable. 
But it's difficult to say that there is an enforceable obligation unless you know who to enforce it against. When you may be entitled to damages, it's only fair that if you don't know who is responsible, the clock should not start to run until you do know, or can reasonably be expected to know who caused the loss, injury, or damage. And section five of the bill does just that for a five-year prescription, because it makes little sense for the prescription clock to start running when the creditor is aware of the cause of their loss, but does not know who is responsible for it. If it's fair to creditors that the five-year clock will not start until they discover the identity of the person responsible, then it's also fair to defenders that the 20-year clock does not carry on indefinitely against them. And it is a feature of the current law that both the five-year and the 20-year prescriptive periods run from when an obligation becomes enforceable. For obligations to pay damages, this means when the loss, injury or damage occurs. And as a result, a long period of time can pass after the act or remission before the 20-year period starts to run. Another feature is the 20-year prescription can be interrupted and the clock reset. So it is possible for a very long time to pass before an obligation finally prescribes. The bill will address both by making the 20-year prescription in relation to obligations to pay damages begin on the date of the defender's act or omission, while also making the 20-year prescription a true long stop by preventing it from being interrupted. Where proceedings are ongoing, when the 20-year period expires, then the prescriptive period is extended until the proceedings are finished. And I am grateful to the committee for their work in clarifying how this extension would apply to property rights. As time is running out, I will briefly mention some of the miscellaneous provisions that are set out in the bill. First, the bill allows parties, once a dispute has arisen, to agree to extend, once only, the five-year prescriptive period for up to a maximum of one year. And this is so they can negotiate an end to their dispute without the need to resort to legal proceedings, meaning they can avoid the expense of protracted litigation. Second, the bill seeks to take account of claims that are made in sequestrations and company administration receiverships, both of which are not covered by the definition of relevant claim and so cannot stop the prescription clock. And I would like to conclude by saying that the approach taken in the bill is not one of wholesale reform. It is, after all, one piece of the wider jigsaw that is Scots law. The focus is on those areas that have been identified by the Scottish Law Commission as causing difficulty in practice, and it is these areas that the bill addresses. Prescription plays an essential part in Scots law, balancing the interests of creditors on the one hand and debtors on the other. And I believe that this bill strikes a fair balance overall, redressing causes of unfairness for creditors and debtors, whilst also serving the wider interests of fairness, justice and certainty. Presiding officer, I move that the Parliament agrees that the prescription Scotland bill be passed. Thank you. I now call Graham Simpson. Five minutes, please, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The prescription bill has made its way through the parliamentary process until uh, this point, barely noticed. <laughs> Members can be thankful to the DPLR committee for doing the heavy work on this and protecting them from its intricacies. And I thank the clerks uh, uh, of the committee. And members would have been none the wiser about it until Richard Leonard brought it to the First Minister's attention earlier today. A nation, a nation will be watching this session agog, no doubt, thanks to Mr. Leonard. Presiding officer, this bill may not have set the heather on fire until today, but it's important nonetheless. Gordon Lindhurst spoke at length, well, it certainly seemed that way, uh, during the stage one debate and... Ah, Mr. Lindhurst. Mr. Lindhurst. Um, I, I think in fairness to myself, my contribution or non-contribution having been mentioned, um, does the member uh, agree with me that it would be helpful for the minister to clarify what she meant by the suggestion that uh, the 20-year time period, uh, in fact, might be meaningless um, in the question about the 5- and 10-year, 20-year prescription because of some concept of delay in Scots law? I mean... Uh, that seems to 
if anything, if it's not there, make the argument for Neil Findlay's uh, amendments that have been rejected. Um, it's, it's not a... It's, I, 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 think, I think that intervention is also at length, but I'll give you some of your time back, Mr Simpson. <laughs> um, I think I agree with that, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, you, can see, you, you, you can no doubt see why Mr Lindhurst's catchphrase is a dry pause. <laughs> <coughs> the, the, bill, uh, the bill is a Scottish Law Commission bill. It aims to amend the law relating to the extension of civil rights and obligations by passage of time. Is he okay back there? <laughs> it concerns negative prescription only. That's the time limit within which a person who's aggrieved must raise their claim in court. If the time limit is missed, the ability to pursue the claim is lost. The bill would amend the current law found in the Prescription and Limitation Scotland Act 1973. That says that some legal obligations are affected by five-year prescription, some are only affected by 20-year prescription, uh, and so, some are never brought to an end by prescription. In other words, there are some cases where you have five years in which to take action, others where you have 20. It's important to strike the right balance. Now, most of the bill is not controversial, uh, but we've heard earlier uh, the areas that uh, have been. Uh, I don't uh, propose to go over those because we've had that debate. Um, but let me give you uh, an example, uh, another example of why the bill is so important, and it's not council tax or benefits. It's the case of Morrison versus ICL Plastics. Uh, this stemmed from the tragic explosion at the Stockline Plastics Factory in Glasgow in May 2004, in which nine employees were killed and many left seriously injured. The case centred on a nearby business, David T. Morrison & Co., which had suffered significant damage from the explosion. And when it sued ICL Plastics, who owned Stockline for its loss, ICL defended the claim on the basis that it had already prescribed. In essence, Mr. Morrison was told he was too late to receive justice. The case revolved around the interpretation of the existing legislation and what was the start date, what start date was on which the loss, injury or damage occurred. And while Morrison believed that the start date was in 2013, when it found out the explosion was ICL's fault, ICL argued that the start date had begun in 2004, when Morrison's had initially suffered the loss. The Supreme Court, by a majority of three to two, found in favour of ICL. So the bill allows the pursuer to know who caused the loss before the prescription period begins. It will mean that in future, people like David Morrison, trying to seek recompense for damage suffered due to negligence, will not be told it is too late. And that is a welcome change to the law. We support the bill. Thank you very much. I now call Daniel Johnson. Mr Johnson. Please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Prescription may well be a technical area of law, but it is one that undoubtedly has very direct and real human consequences. Reform and protecting people from unreasonable pursuit of debt is both the right thing to do, but will also protect some of the most vulnerable people in the most difficult of circumstances. So Labour will be supporting this bill this evening and supports what it sets out to do, but let's be clear, it is far from perfect. That is why we sought to amend it, to make it fairer and to make it more just. And so we're disappointed that the government did not support our amendments, and this is undoubtedly a missed opportunity. But I would like to thank the many people and organisations and the DPR committee and the clerks for the informed uh, debate that we have had on this important issue, sharing insights and experience uh, which uh, has undoubtedly been of use. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge the Scottish Law Commission whose work prompted this bill's introduction in the first place. Prescription encourages people to enforce their rights promptly before it becomes too difficult for the person or organisation defending a claim to gather appropriate evidence. Delay can cause the quality of evidence needed to defend a court case to deteriorate. Bills and bank statements become damaged or destroyed. Frankly,
Who here keeps their bank statements for more than a couple of years, let alone 20? So witnesses might also have died or become untraceable or simply might, just, uh, might not recall the facts. So having an unduly long time limit might leave people to being pursued for debts after a length of time that anyone would consider to be unreasonable, leaving people vulnerable to high penalties many years after they first incurred them when they even, may not even be aware or, or receive notice of those debts at all. The prescription bill before us therefore makes positive changes like the amendment of discoverability, uh, which, uh, sorry, the test for discoverability, which will ensure that three criteria must be fulfilled before the five-year prescription period begins. These changes are positive and will make a real difference. But that is also why the government's failure to back our amendments are so disappointing, because they render their approach inconsistent. As the bill currently stands, council tax and benefits payments administered by the Department for Work and Pensions are exempted from the five-year prescription period, making them subject to the 20-year period. So this bill makes it clear that it is unreasonable for individuals and private companies to be subject to a 20-year prescription period. So if it is unreasonable for individuals and private companies to pursue debts in those circumstances, why does the government believe it's acceptable for state bodies whose very existence and purpose is to support people? Why is it reasonable for, them, for the state and for the government to be exempted uh, uh, or, 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 or from a five-year prescription period? And if five years is right for, the Scottish, for Scottish social security debt, surely it is reasonable period for UK social security debt. This inconsistency, this double standard, at best encourages and facilitates bad practice and inefficiency from the state. The state that should be leading by example, not looking for get-out clauses. It is deeply unfair that people can be pursued for a debt and charged interest that they were unaware of for up to 20 years. That is why we propose to reduce the amount of time local authorities have to notify a people that they are in debt before that debt expires. We do not believe that there is too much to expect our public bodies to be able to organise their finances in that reasonable time. Recognising that this would be a significant change of bill, we offered a compromise. We offered to the government a delay of the introduction of a five-year prescription for council tax by five years. A grace period, if you like, that would have given local authorities 10 years to get their uh, affairs into order. But no. Given the evidence for removing the exemption from council tax uh, for the five-year prescription is compelling, which is why Sisters Advice Scotland, Step Change, Money Advice Scotland, and indeed the Lost Society support it. So let me turn, though, to the, government's, uh, the, the advice that the government sought. You know, not too long ago, people were being hounded for hist historic full tax debt. So why then is this Scottish government enabling historic injustices to be repeated? Why is this Scottish government taking its cues from the UK government? Because in, let's be clear, we are talking about debts accrued through the public's benefit system. Debts incurred through, amongst other things, the rollout of universal credit. So why on earth are you, SNP ministers seeking advice from a government as reviled as this current Tory government in Westminster? In a policy area where that government is willfully impoverishing people and writing, asking for, for advice from Esther McVeigh, the very re minister responsible for so much of that damage, uh, that is being done through the role of universal credit, that is frankly shocking. The SNP should be ashamed that they are taking their policy cues from this shocking and shameful Conservative government. In conclusion, afraid, this bill yes, is far better. from perfect. Sorry, it contains conclude. many good measures and we will be supporting it, but this is undoubtedly a missed opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Liam MacArthur. Mr MacArthur, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Obviously, I know uh, time is short. Um, I don't want to speak for, for long, but I think the controversy surrounding uh, the uh, amendments earlier on this afternoon uh, perhaps make it worthwhile uh, me setting out some thoughts on that core issue of, of dispute. But before I do that, can I uh, join with others in, in uh, thanking the Scottish Law Commission for their work on this, the DPLR Committee for the scrutiny work that they've uh, carried out so diligently and put on record Scottish Liberal Democrat support for legislation I believe will help modernise and bring a greater degree of clarity to the law surrounding uh, prescription here in Scotland. Establishing a cut-off point for claims to be raised or rights to be asserted has the advantage of providing certainty, giving individuals and businesses a chance to organise their affairs and plan for the future. And even for those pursuing a, a claim or a debt or an obligation, uh, they will benefit, I believe, from the enforced discipline of making any claim in good time. 
In terms of the perspective, uh, perspective I mean, uh, exemption of council tax and business rates from the five-year prescription, I accept that the case may be more uh, nuanced than we heard some of that played out this afternoon. CAS and others working to support those who find themselves in financial di difficulty uh, do have concerns uh, with such an exemption, as indeed does the Law Society. Uh, but while I think the, the argument that councils, um, like others, have, uh, have to be required to do everything uh, possible to pursue debts in a timely fashion, uh, I struggle to accept that the 6% penalty charge that attaches to unpaid council tax would act as a disincentive on the collecting council. I can't see a council adopting a strategy, and that effectively would be what it is, to deliberately delay collections in order to increase penalty charges. Cosler's concern that introducing a five-year prescription would, quote, disincentivise payment and lead to a decline in in-year collection seems to me uh, to be credible uh, and, and worthy of our uh, consideration. And uh, I think even with the grace period set out by Daniel Johnson uh, in his comments earlier, uh, I think it would uh, potentially inhibit current work to collect outstanding debt at a time when every council in Scotland is having to deal with budget cuts. On that basis, Deputy Presiding Officer, and on balance, my party was not persuaded by the case put forward uh, by Neil Finlay earlier. We would, of course, be interested in the outcome of any future consultation on this specific issue in due course. Uh, for now, however, I can confirm that Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting the legislation uh, at decision time shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call and ask Jed Denham, Minister, to close and wind up the, de wind up the debate for the Government, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would first off like to begin by thanking all the members today for their contribution to what has been an important debate. I have listened to what has been said and I welcome the support offered for the provisions of this bill by members from parties across the Chamber. In closing the debate, I will pick up on a few of the provisions of the bill which have been discussed this afternoon, which aim to bring clarity, legal certainty and fairness to the law of negative prescription in Scotland. As mentioned already, Section 3 extends the five-year negative prescription to cover all statutory obligations to make payment that are not already subject to that rule, with some exceptions. This general rule provides a more straightforward means to establish whether an obligation prescribes after five years or after 20 years. We have already spent a lot of time on this this afternoon discussing some of the exceptions to the general rule, so I won't go over this again, but it's enough to say that there are some exceptions to this rule, obligations which are primarily of a public nature and they maintain the status quo. Section 5 of the bill is an important section because it is the one that has caused some anxiety for practitioners. The bill seeks to restore a more equal balance between a pursuer and defender where damages are sought. And it does this by laying out a three-part test that, when met, begins the five-year prescription clock. It will now not start until pursuers discover the identity of the person responsible for the loss, injury or damage caused and could reasonably be expected to have identified the person responsible. Equally, for defenders, the 20-year prescription clock does not carry on indefinitely against them. This creates a fine balance between the rights of a pursuer seeking to enforce their obligation and the duties of a defender to undertake their obligation. In the case of obligation to pay damages, the 20-year prescriptive period begins on the date of the act or omission giving rise to the claim. It makes the 20-year prescription no longer amenable to interruption, either by relevant claim or by a relevant acknowledgement while allowing the 20-year prescriptive period to be extended where a relevant claim has been made during the prescriptive period, but by the end of that period, the claim has not been finally disposed of and the proceedings are ongoing. Finally, I want to mention the extension of the five-year negative prescription period by agreement that this bill allows. This provision recognises the need to balance the interest of legal certainty with a way of resolving disputes that does not require going to court in the first instance. Such agreements can be entered into only after a dispute has arisen and allows the prescriptive period to be extended by a maximum of one year. And I was glad to see the committee recognise the merit of such agreements at stage one. In summary, I would like once more to thank members who have contributed to today's debate. I'm pleased to hear members express their support for the principles of the bill, 
and that is to provide certainty, clarity to those areas of the law of negative prescription that have caused practical difficulties in operation. The provisions of this bill protect those who have a claim from running out of time in which to proceed with it, change the current situation of possible perpetual liability, including for those who have historic council tax debt, and make clearer which obligations prescribe after five years. And I commend the motion in my name, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Minister. And that concludes the debate on the Prescription Scotland Bill at Stage 3, and it's time to move on to the next item of business.